as I sit here, I experience uh, many qualities like greenness of the screen, yes. droplets of rain falling on skin, and a lot of inner experience. That, uh, and it seems that uh, there is someone having this experiences. Yes. There is constant self that is having these experiences. Uh, can you explain why this uh, is wrong? Why there are no selves? Well, first of all, to start very simple, science tells us there are no colored objects in this world. So the greenness or the orangeness of these uh, trousers are properties of the model of my leg with the trousers or the plants the uh, brain uh, creates. It's a prediction about what the next sensory stimulus will be and that creates a model. So the first thing one has to understand is that in terms of conscious experience, we live inside a model. It's the best hypothesis the brain has about what to expect in the next milliseconds or so. That is what we are consciously experiencing. So this has not been optimized over millions of years to be the correct or veridical representation of the world around us. It has been optimized to make us have many children, to copy our genes effectively, to deny our mortality, to have an optimism bias. So this model is not an optimal model from a scientific point of view. It's an optimal uh, model from the point of view of evolutionary dynamics. Um, it's a result of millions of years of selection. Now that model doesn't only have colors and objects, and physics tells us there are no objects in, in a strict sense, in a philosophical sense, individual substances, but it also has a model of a self, me that is sitting here and talking to you, that is controlling its speech behavior, maybe controlling its thoughts, controlling its attention, and that creates a phenomenology of a self. And there's also a model of the seeing process. There's not only a model of these colored objects, but there's a model of the process of seeing that connects the self with the world. And we have to understand that all of this is a model which was useful to help this organism to survive. So if we look into the brain, we don't find cells. The self, and that's actually a trivial claim, is not a substance. A substance is nothing chemical, but is a technical term from philosophy. Philosophers call a substance something that could exist all by itself. And the sense of self is not something that could exist without the brain, for instance, or without the physical world, or with information processing. So what we actually have is not a self, but a self-model that is created by our brain, that has a long evolutionary history. And the trick is, because we are not able to recognize this model as a model, to experience it as a model, we identify with it. The organism, which we are, the organism is real, is so to speak glued into the content of its own self-model. It's like we are born in virtual reality, we are immersed, we have an immersive hallucination just like in a dream. This takes place in the brain, but we have the experience we are outside of the brain in the real world. And it creates an embodied self and we identify with it. We also, as the organism gets immersed into that model of the self, and that gives many people the feeling that philosophically there must be something like a thing, and that thing is the self. But we don't find this thing nowhere in the world. <laughs> Does it have any adaptive value? What could be the benefit for survival? Having phenomenal yes. self model. So the conscious self model has many different layers. And uh, for instance, you have to control the movement of your body. That's one origin of a self model. And there you have to have a good 
itself model. If you're a monkey jumping from branch to branch, you have to have a very good online model of how heavy is my body, how um, will this branch carry its weight, how fast can I jump. If that model is not accurate, you will not have any children. If you are living in a social group, you also need a model, is this guy stronger than me? Should I better pick a fight with this guy or not? Can I run faster than this guy if I have to run away? Am I the most pretty girl in this group or not? So there's also a social self model, there's a bodily self model. There are even deeper levels. For instance, homeostatic self-control. We have to control breathing, digestion, um, heartbeat, the oxygen level in our blood, the blood sugar level in our blood. All this is self-modeling. It's a constant process of representing properties of the body in very narrow windows, else we would be dead, and it has to work. So I think the body model is mostly pretty accurate because it has to be accurate. But then there are also higher levels, for instance, the autobiographical self model, my own life history, um, that are not so veridical. Many people forget how many failures they've had in the past of their life and how much they have suffered. Evolution just wants the organism to go on and on and on and never stop, even if it's not in the interest of the organism. And we have many cognitive biases in the higher level of, of our self model. One very well known bias is optimism bias. All human beings think they will have more positive experiences in the future than is actually realistic. So I think the lower levels of the self model are very good, very accurate, they're old. We share them with animals. And the higher levels have something to do with culture and society. And there's a lot of things that are wrong there. <laughs> what kind of systems are conscious? Is it biological systems or substrate that doesn't matter and it's a property of information processing system? We don't know. Uh, what consciousness is. We don't have a theory of consciousness. I think there's something very simple. Um, uh, I am researching right now what is the simplest form of consciousness, which has a lot to do with meditation experiences. And I think there is something we are mostly not aware of. That's a quality of pure consciousness or bare wakefulness. So. We don't only have a perception of green flowers or orange uh, trousers, but when we wake up in the morning, there's a part of our brain that activates everything. And I think that part that creates wakefulness, if we have a representation of this, I think that's very, I'm putting it extremely simple. Um, if we are not only awake, but we know that we are, then we are conscious. So I think some coma patients, waking coma patients in the vegetative state, they are awake, but they're not conscious. They go through wake and dream cycles uh, every day. But they have no conscious experience. And again, to put it very simply, I think they are awake, but they don't know that they are awake. They don't have a self model of themselves as being awake right now. Now the question is, could a machine have that? Do you have to be a biological system? And I think, yes, a machine could have that. A machine could, for instance, auto-activate, just as your phone auto-activates at uh, three o'clock the, in the night to do an update and then goes to sleep again. And a, a machine could have a model of this process of auto-activation as well. It could know I have now auto-activated myself. And then it might have a very simple form of being awake, of being conscious, which doesn't mean having a self or self, a sense of self yet. It would be just that the lights are on, so to speak. And um, 
I think it's really possible that machines are conscious, although it's not going to happen tomorrow, and it's not going to happen the day after tomorrow. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. You described uh, the brain somehow drills physical reality. Uh, I want to know what is the drilling process, how it ah. happens. This was just trying to create a metaphor yes. and maybe the metaphor is not good. So the first part of this ego tunnel metaphor was that just for conscious experience this is an internal model. It's really in the brain. It's, it's a bubble. It's a virtual reality in the brain. This is not true for knowledge. I think we are embedded, embodied, situated beings. And for knowledge relationships, we are in contact. There is an outside world. But just for phenomenal contact, just for the quality of the experience, that is internally determined. But of course, there are external facts that, for instance, determine, is this a hallucination or is it a good perception? Um, so the outside world plays a role, but consciousness is something internal in the brain. Now, if you would say mm, this is like a bubble, you know, a, a Truman Show bubble or, or something like this, mm, then it would be frozen in a moment. And maybe some simple animals actually have a conscious bubble in their brain, but they are in an eternal now, always in a now and no time flowing. And by calling it an ego tunnel, I wanted uh, to express the fact that we are also moving through time. You know, we have in our experience, we have a now, but we also have duration, we anticipate a future. So we are like a bubble that is moving um, uh, through, um, through time, phenomenologically. And the big question, of course, is what brain mechanisms create this? And these are very deep and difficult questions and I have no answer, but it has something to do with how does the brain represent time? How does it represent the fact that this is now, this is the actual moment, and that there's a next moment, a little bit in the future, and I'm constantly going into that next moment. Um, I think that's a big research area for computational modeling, for neuroscience and for philosophy to understand this forward movement because those mechanisms that create that the phenomenal timeline, those mechanisms would give the answer to your question what the drilling is, the drilling process through the physical world, but I don't know. What is dynamical core hypothesis? Dynamic? Dynamical core hypothesis. Uh, okay, there are different different hypotheses uh, about what consciousness is, and one hypothesis uh, by Ilman and Tononi in the past, which has is now mostly called integrated information theory, is that in the very complex dynamics of the brain. Um, there is a core state always, a state where, where information really comes together and is integrated, and that that is uh, the conscious part. I think we must never forget two things. One thing is the brain is the most complex physical object we know in all of the universe. We know nothing is as complicated as the brain, and most of our knowledge most of our intelligence is completely unconscious. Most of the things we know about the world and we know about ourselves are all in unconscious brain processing. So the question is, is what is that little, 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 little piece where the lights are on and where there's experience? What is different about this little, little, little partition of the overall dynamic? Nobody knows, but one idea is maximal integration. How did uh, biological biological evolution uh, became cultural evolution? Uh, 
in terms of mirror neurons? That's a very good question. I have no idea. Uh, I can only speculate. So um, we already talked about the conscious self model. There's a conscious self model and there's an unconscious self model. And I think the self model actually in our brain is a subpersonal state. The person is the whole organism with the conscious self model and a specific self model, namely a model of itself as a person. Then you're a person. And most animals have bodies, they have conscious self models, but they don't have a person model. And I think person models, philosophers have written a lot about this, have only um, emerged in human cultural interactions. I look at you and I think he is a rational individual and you look at me and you also acknowledge, recognize, accept me as a rational individual or even as a moral subject. And then we both see at the same time, ah, he's doing it with me and I'm doing it with him. And then you have a very high level of social organization. Of course, there are low levels of social organization, for instance, in ants, in bees, in fish, in birds. But human societies are very special, I think. And it may have something to do with the fact that the human self model is very different from the chimpanzee self model. It's a platform, for instance, for saying you are a person and I'm a person, or a platform for saying you are a moral subject and I'm a moral subject, and we all together. That creates a new group dynamics. But I think there's something else what many people don't see is there are not only self-models in individual animals like me, but there are also supra-personal self-models. For instance, in a good society, um, the parliament would be the self-model of the society, where the different parts are represented, coordinated, and that makes the whole society coherent and able to live. You know? That would be the idea. Now, I think chimpanzees have some model of the group, of the interests of the chimpanzee troop, but not very good. I mean, in chimpanzees, we know, you know, if they see a banana, they don't tell anybody else, and, and, and then they make a call that everybody looks upward and thinks a predatory bird, and they quickly take the banana. So they are aware that there's the group interests and there are my interests. And I think that may be a decisive step in the step from biological to cultural evolution. Uh, on higher levels, like human societies, that you have a model of my interests and the interests of my children and my family, and then maybe the interests of the whole group, 160 people, early, you know, early groups of early human beings. Today, everything's very difficult with globalization and 8 billion people on the planet. And moral behavior, I think, comes when beings make a trade-off between group interests and individual interests. When the group begins to punish individuals that do something that is against group interests, and then you suddenly you have a little model of the group watching you. It is maybe you remember that when you were a child, your mother told you, God sees everything. And uh, that is, I think it's a, a computational step. You try to install a witness, a permanent witness in the mind of the individual. Even if no human being sees you, God sees you. Something knows if you are good or bad. It sees your thoughts even, your feelings and your actions, even if there's nobody there. So religion may also have something to do with representing the interests of the group very strongly in the mind of the individual through invisible persons, gods, angels, something like that, but also through what Christians call conscience, you know, and that is a very interesting point about consciousness actually. For many hundred years against, until Descartes, conscientia, the Latin term and the Greek terms, 
actually meant being conscious, uh, conscientious. That is to have a higher order moral judgment. You have a thought and you think, was this a good thought or a bad thought? Should I have had this feeling or not? And by that sense today, you could have many people who see colors and have a sense self, but they're completely unconscious because they are investment bankers or politicians uh, who just without any conscience work for their own profit in some way and damage the common good. So we have this modern idea of what is consciousness, it's seeing colors, having feelings, having a perspective, but there's an old deeper sense also, it has a lot to do with Christian philosophy, really being conscious means to have conscientia, a, you know, um, Gewissen in Germany, uh, in German, I don't know what, in Jordan, what would be the word? Yeah. And is it related to the word for consciousness in Georgian? No, totally yeah. different. Word. Yeah, when it came into uh, from Latin into English and into German, you can still see the two meanings. So one could say somebody who has no conscience is not conscious at all. And that has something to do with cultural evolution, I think. Somebody who has no model of the group, of the cultural context, in a certain sense, she or he is unconscious. Why do we dream? Huh. Um, we don't know yet, but I think it has, dreaming has something to do with long-term memory consolidation. You have uh, to restructure the things you learned during the day and sort out those things you want to keep. But there may even be a much simpler um, explanation that it has something to do with thermoregulation that, um, you know, when we were sleeping in the past, it was a very dangerous situation. We always had to be able to get up if an animal attacks us and be wide awake very fast. And it could be that this uh, dreaming phases uh, was also just in the beginning just a mechanism to keep the body temperature up, uh, to, like to reboot the whole thing to a simulation that it is ready to wake up and act quickly that it has something to do with regulating the temperature of the brain, that you don't cool down too much. But I don't know much about this. There are other people who know much more. <laughs> I've been interested in uh, sorry, the simulation theory. Yes. Uh, yes. anti uh, anti That we create simulation inside the brain about possible threats from the environment. And yes. That suggests evolutionary you should really make an interview with Jennifer Wint about this or with Antti himself, but I think threat simulation explains a lot, um, but maybe not everything. But it's a very good idea and a very good point because in our evolutionary context it was very important to have a model of threats. So maybe you know that most human beings are a little paranoid and nervous. And there's a reason for this. In the past, um, when we were walking and there was some movement in the bushes, <coughs> and it was not clear, is it the wind or is it an animal? It was much more important to be 10 times wrong and think there's an animal and watch out and be afraid. So we have hyper um, sensitive agent detectors. And then to have one situation where we think, ah, this is only the wind and then we would have no children anymore. So <clears throat> we are, for millions of years when our life was very dangerous, it was very important to constantly scan the environment if there's a movement in the, in the, in the grasses. Could this be a threat? And this is also a good example how evolution did not um, act in our own interest. We have very safe environments today but we cannot relax. We're always a little anxious, a little neurotic, nervous. We think about burglars much more often than is normal, the police, whatever it is we think about. And that's our evolutionary history. Um, it makes us unhappy. It le doesn't let us come to peace, but it creates more genetic success, more procreation, more children. And it's only normal 
If that is the case, then it also is the case at night when we sleep, that we simulate possible uh, threats. Also, <clears throat> maybe you have seen if there is a car uh, accident with people hurt on the street, how everybody stands there and gazes and it's, it's really annoying and the police has problems but that is of course uh, I think because we try to learn in this situation it's a very important dangerous situation we don't have much experience with it so we want to see what is happening there that's why we are so curious and that has something with threat simulation too we could have a car accident and how does it look what you do and uh, the last time I had a small accident, nobody helped me. I got really angry. I was in a car and a bus smashed on it from behind. And the first thing I saw was a little boy with filming me through the window with his mobile phone. And there was a crowd of people and they were all amused and interested. And many of them were laughing. Not a single person asked, are you hurt? Do you have a problem? try to open the door it was just people oh here is something unexpectedly entertaining let's look at the two people in the car how do they look and uh, that I think is also part of our evolutionary past we don't want to get involved in this maybe there's blood maybe it's difficult but we want to see it and that is has something to do with threat simulation why is conscious experience unified that why is there a unity of consciousness? Philosophers have wondered for this for centuries, the transcendental unity of apperception. And the interesting thing is when normal people think about consciousness, they don't even see it as a problem. Because normally, for most of us, this is always one world, one self, one situation. And uh, it seems so natural and simple that we don't understand that there's a big computational problem behind it. The brain has to integrate colors and sounds and background scenes and shapes, spatial relations, temporal relations. The brain has to fuse a lot of things into one integrated model of reality. And most people don't see this as um, a problem because they have never experienced anything else, but there are people. Uh, for instance, people with se severe psychiatric uh, disorders can have the experience that parallel relation, uh, realities are opening and there's more than one world and more than one situation. And people who have experimented with the classical hallucinogens like LSD or psilocybin or me uh, mescaline, they can make sense sometimes of the, situa of the possibility that there might not be one world but multiple worlds at the same time. So most people don't see this as a problem. We, a little thing we sometimes have is when you wake up in the morning, sometimes and you wake up out of a dream and say there have been people in the room, five people in the dream. There may be one second where you already see your bedroom when you open your eyes, but the dream people are still somehow there. Maybe for one second or two seconds when you wake up, you have two worlds or two situations, but not most people don't know it. And um, I think it's a great problem, uh, the unity for science, to explain the unity of consciousness. I call it the one world problem in the Ego Tunnel book. But an interesting fact is, is that the unity is also more or less. So, um, Sometimes you can have the feeling your world is really unified and integrated. It's a very real and consistent situation. But sometimes people really say, my world is falling apart. If your mother has died or your girlfriend leaves you, um, your world is falling apart. It really threatens the coherence of your self model. And that is also what the Greeks said. The old Greeks said, when the senses come together, hearing and seeing, then you are conscious. But if the senses fall apart, if seeing and hearing doesn't come together anymore, then you faint, you lose consciousness. So integration is one key topic. Uh, 
can you explain why so many people became uh, obsessed with nationalism around the world? That's a, a big problem. So um, the technical term is tribalism. We have very deep in us for millions of years. Um, we have mechanisms in our self model and the human self model that we identify with our group and we will make bring great sacrifices for our own group we will even sacrifice our own life but there's this in group out group mechanisms people who do not belong to our group um, are not human beings they are barbarians they are infidels, they don't believe in God, they believe, believe in something strange, you know, they have another religion, which means you can kill them like animals. They are not real persons. So tribalism is a mechanism that allowed us to do some, one thing um, that's amazing about human beings. We can be very, very solidaric with conspecifics, children, grandchildren, mother, father, family, and at the same time, Without any compassion, we can kill other human beings in war. If it's a question of our territory, territory or they want to rape our women. So I have always been fascinated and shocked by this, of course, that we have this mechanism of having deep compassion to human beings. And at the same time, we're able to kill in an ice cold way in war situations also. Or if somebody attacks our children or something like that, then we can just kill other human beings. And that has to do, I think, with a switch in the self-model, with what group do you identify with? And of course, in evolution in our past, it was very important if you were in a small group of human beings, 20,000 years ago or so, roaming around, you had no survival chance without the group. No, you, you just couldn't leave. Uh, you had to be with them. They were your guarantee for survival. And if there was another group, you had to kill these people. You know, and uh, that's where it comes from. Now we have just overcome these biological mechanisms, and I think basically two things have happened. One thing is there's this predatory American-style turbo capitalism that has made the income gap ever steeper. So there are now extremely rich people on the planet, um, uh, and. The poor are actually becoming richer through globalization also, but not as fast. So it's as you are on an escalator and on one side the rich are moving up in an escalator all the time and you are on the escalator that's coming down and you, you have to walk always faster, 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 but you can never catch up with the rich even though you get higher. And people realize they are cut off. For instance, neo-Nazis in Eastern Germany they see in this process, they begin, begin to realize they are the losers. They play no role anymore. There will be artificial intelligence. Their jobs will be coming. There will be Muslim refugees who work for much less money. Uh, you know, uh, their jobs are gone. So they fall back on a lower biological level. I think what is happening in the planet, on the planet right now we shouldn't describe it so much in these high theoretical levels about populism and nationalism. There's actually a low, lower order biological mechanism that makes us fall back into tribalism. That is because we have created societies in a way that many people feel threatened because they have the feeling, I am not part of these gr this group anymore. And then there's a second thing. And the second thing is completely new, it's globalization and the internet. Everybody suddenly sees what is going on in other places of the world. For instance, all the people in the poor countries see on their phone how rich the top 2% of the planet are. They see it for the first time. Um, it's growing. It's becoming very fast. People see from the media how many refugees there will be in the future from climate crisis and uh, maybe financial crashes people see that this problem with refugees and territorial justice will not stop it's going to become stronger 
then there's this aspect of secularization, you know, science and enlightenment and philosophy have undermined religious worldviews. But 80% of the people on this planet still live deeply in a religious uh, worldview. And now people like you come and ask people about there is no self, don't even talk about the soul anymore, even say there's no self, and they talk about cultural evolution. And many people, I think, have the feeling this is just too much. It's too much information. The change is too fast for me. I want something simple and traditional. And that is my tribe, my nation, my territory. And that is now um, happening at many places at the same time and is very, very dangerous. But I would actually describe it as a fallback uh, um, behind certain levels of cultural evolution we had. Democratic, open societies, freedom of speech, you know, minority rights and all these things. We had just in some places of the world had just achieved it. I think there are about 160 countries in the world and only 22 are stable democracies right now. It could co disappear completely. Democracy could have been a historical phase. And it could also be that major non-national actors like Google or Microsoft are the political entities of the future. And I think many people will see this and they have the feeling I am losing this is too much for my mind, this is too much for my heart, I just want something very simple here. And that is how this nationalism uh, is created, but it's a dead-end street, because we know nationalism leads to war, sooner or later, it leads to war. So the question is if we can restructure the process of globalization in a way that we come back to a higher level of cultural evolution. Nobody knows how this is going, but I hope our future is open. Thank you. Good. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Yeah? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs>